Welcome back to the second part of the pre-scene analysis. Now we are still going through the Beagle case in the SBO exam. Now, before we dip into the next paragraph, it's very important, as I said in the last section, that the life cycle in the industry, very, very important in that. Now, I've taken this information from the pre-scene. As you can see, that the information related to revenue, okay, in this company from the financial information from the KPI's point of view, that I've taken this and I've just calculated the growth rate year on year, or YOY, which means I take this year's revenue and to subtract last year's revenue and to divide into last year's revenue. Now, for example, from this to that, increasing by 35.71%. However, from this to that, only increase by 6.49%. Now, as you can see, that it, it seems to me that uh, we are growing our business fairly quickly. However, the growth rate slows down in terms of our company's own revenue. Now, later on, I will also show you from a market's point of view that the growth rate is, seems to be very similar to our company as well. So we can say that this industry, we are still at the growth stage not necessarily at the maturity stage, but growth stage, currently. So this means that at the growth stage, what we can say is that we will need to increase our revenue as quickly as possible. We also need to know that there might be costs related to that as well. Now, let me show you an idea of what do I mean by the growth stage in the industry of life cycle. Now, if you are at the growth stage, so this means that everything will be moving upwards. So this means that you will generate lots and lots of revenue by taking advantage at the growth stage in the industry of life cycle. Which means that when you are doing anything that you want, things seem to be quite easy for you to generate into revenue. You can attract lots of customers. So during the growth stage, and of course, there will be huge costs that you need to maintain the revenue. So for example, marketing and so on. So this means that at the growth stage, my suggestion to the Beagle company, yes, diversifying the services that we can offer. So, for example, beyond ride hailing services, for example, the food delivery and even the logistical and the goods delivery as well. So, of course, one of the ideas, and even from the evidence from the pre scene that we may be expanding the micro-mobility services, which means something like the bicycles, that kind of stuff, because you can see that Uber, Lyft, and even Didi in China has expanded into these areas. But from my perspective, that this business model is not the same as the right hailing service. The reason is, if we were to expand into the micro-mobility services, of course, we are currently offering that, but if we want to take a step further, so we will need to invest quite lots of money in that. However, for the right hailing service, you don't really have to buy any cars at all because 
you are working with drivers who are independent contractors. Although, for example, in the UK, they qualify to be the workers, okay, per the law in the UK. However, still, the drivers would just be the independent uh, contractors, for example. So, which means that we don't have to invest quite lots of money in that. So, on the exam day, because in the law section that I've told you, a particular case in China is called OFO. Okay, so the OFO company introduced the micro mobility services by expanding its business by lot by lots of bicycles. Now, in 2016, when I firstly saw this case in OFO, because at that particular moment in time, I was in Beijing, in China, teaching university students. And one of my students showed me that, Steve, look around, we've got so many bicycles, uh, they are from the OFO company. And I said to myself, what is the point that this company can make profit? I don't really understand at that particular moment in time, it's not normal at all. But things got clearer. After one year, I started to understand their business model would be to get the customer's money in terms of the deposit, which means in financial accounting terms, and that would be a contract liability, owing lots and lots of money to the users. And finally, it cannot pay the money back to these users who used their bicycles, and they failed. Now, they're simply using gearing or collecting money in advance and to expand the customer base without necessarily having enough money to further expand this business and paying the money back to the users. Okay. So you need to understand, although micro-mobility, yes, is good for environment, but actually, you will need to care about uh, the funding problem. Okay, although our company is a public listed company, but still liquidity issue, we need to understand that. We can even focus on the electric vehicles as well. And of course, from the environmental point of view, there will be lots and lots of scandals around the world. For example, for the Uber uh, and even for Lyft. And even for uh, Grab, okay, it's another the, uh, company in the TNC industry that they claim to expand their business, for example, introducing the electric vehicles. However, they didn't do that. Not many users used the electric vehicles because of the lots of problems. So one of the major problems would be the infrastructure costs they need to care about. If I'm the examiner in the SBA exam, I would certainly set a particular question this time related to the partnership with the public sector organisations. So, which means that the government to consider investing money, uh, so setting up a new business, investing money in the infrastructures to support the electric vehicles. Uh, in this city, and we need to determine the board structure. So, most likely, will be the two tier board structure rather than the unitary board structure now uh, that we can see in our current business. Of course, we can do lots of other things, for example, expand globally and so on, using data analysis for growth and strategic alliances okay, with uh, the local businesses and restaurants and helping them to uh, carry people, carry goods, carry whatever we like, okay, focus on uh, uh, the customer satisfaction and so on to support our business growth. I mean, these are quite obvious and you can read them on your own, but from my perspective, that you need to understand that, okay, we are at the growth stage. So this means that even though we will make mistakes, 
that does not really matter because you've got sufficient revenue to cover all these costs that you may incur. So try something new, yes, will be one of our direction, okay, when you are considering the future strategies. Now, related to Beagle Covenant, when I read the first paragraph and I integrate the stuff from subsequent paragraph because uh, the case scenario will be relatively straightforward compared to uh, other cases in the past because I believe that most of you guys watching this video uh, have already used the services from Ruba or, or other similar companies before. You know the industry from a consumer's point of view. Now, have you covered a particular model from the ACCA SPR syllabus before? It's called the strategy clock. Have you heard of that? So if you can see on the screen, we have got two axes. We've got the low price or high price that you're charging your product or services, and in terms of whether or not you're actually adding value to it. Now, if you're charging low price, not quite a lot of uh, value added stuff, so for example, a bottle of water, and that would be a category number one. It's absolutely fine there. If you are charging low price, but with a bit of perceived added value, so for example, I've got a discounted supermarket and you come inside my supermarket and to pick up the goods that you want. So I provided you with the environment, discounted stall and something like that, category number two. Yes, your business model can still be successful. Now, our company, or Beagle Covenant, is in the, I believe, category number three. It's the hybrid model, which means that the perceived value, yes, medium, but low price. Another real-life example for this, for category number three, will be IKEA. Have you heard of that? Okay. Now, it's absolutely fine in a category number three. Now, how about category number four? Differentiation, which means the medium price and also medium value or even high value, or we can call it as Apple. Okay, Apple product. So, for example, your iPhone, iPad. In category number five, focused differentiation, for example, Rolex watches, okay, there's the value, uh, very high, and the price is super high enough. However, the reason I mention this model is because when you're considering the later strategic options, you will need to always consider two axes price and perceived artifacts. Now, you can't fall into the trap being in the category 6, 7 or 8. So this means that your price is relatively high or standard compared to the values that you offer would not be so high. So if this ratio seems to me more than 1 or very, very high, so this means that you fall into the category 6, 7 or 8. It's very easy that we need to charge more uh, money so we can earn more revenue as a result at the growth stage according to the industry life cycle. And some of the businesses did this before. I'll show you the failed companies. The first failed company was the company called Sidecar, based in the USA. Now, what it did is trying to be, okay, I want to differentiate myself from others. How? One of the ways that it did would be, first is to charge a high price, and then it introduced something that it thinks will be differentiating from other competitors, but not from a user's point of view. For example, it customizes the ride services. For example, passengers can choose the driver based on their profiles. Gosh, man, 
if I'm the user, okay, I want to order this service. I want to go home. I don't really care who would be my driver. At the same time, it introduces the multiple pricing options. If I'm the user, of course, I want the option with the lowest cost, cheapest as possible. However, you allow me with many, many choices. I believe that most of the people that are using these type of apps will certainly look for the cheap option. And other services that it thought it would differentiate itself from others, but in fact it's not. So here's the problem. As I said before, for the strategy clock, look at the value itself. What do you mean by value? Now, value would be from the user's point of view, and that would be one dimension they always need to think about. In simple words, do they need this? If the answer is no, they introduce additional services on that. The second dimension that we can understand the value would be from a relative's point of view, so, which means that from the uh, competitor's point of view, are we better than our competitors in terms of this service that we offer? If the answer is yes, congratulations. Now, other failed companies, for example, Juno, price itself as the premium service provider. However, the service have not really been differentiating from other competitors such as Uber. And also, the Indian company called Taxi for Sure made the similar mistake. So it's very important that you notice the fact that in our company, Kuvane, that we have got many people working in the R&D section or R&D department. So when I firstly read through the pre I questioned myself, do we need so many people working on the research and development? Probably not. The reason is, you kept trying something new, but from a user's point of view, yes, if you can improve the user's experience, absolutely fine, user-friendly. If this is not the case, that would be a major problem that we need to comment on. So do bear in mind that Strategy Clock has not been tested for a very long time in the SBA exam. So make sure that when you are considering the future strategic options, especially that in this industry, increasing the prices that you will charge, you need to be very careful on that. Don't simply fall into the trap that on the exam day, a particular scenario may say that, oh, my company, our company, not performing quite well, uh, and then we are coming up with so many options, one of them pushing up our prices, you need to challenge it from the user point of view, from a competitor's point of view, okay, regarding these sort of issues. Now, as I said before, for the first paragraph, that it is in the TNC industry. I always said to my student, in the past, when I shared the similar case in my class, I always challenged them and to question them, do you think which is more important, economics of scale or benefits of scale? Now, before we dive into anything further, let's differentiate economies of scale and benefits of scale. What would be the difference between these two terms? Now, economies of scale, which means that I would like to take the fixed costs and over the number of units that I provide. Our idea would simply be to increase 
the number of unit in this industry we say it be as the passengers or customers. Alternatively, is to reduce the fixed costs. So we can reach the economies of scale position, which means the fixed cost per unit or fixed cost per passenger. Fixed cost could be lots of things, for example, it's the amortization expenses related to our platform that we provide, that we built before, uh, and then the rental expenses, that kind of stuff. Alternatively, do we look for benefits of scale, which means that we're simply increasing the number of active customers who will be using our platform. I mean, if they were to use our platform, that's good, because we have already gained traffic. So one of the ways that I propose in this industry is that, yes, according to the e-business model in the SBO syllabus, we are currently using the brokerage model. We are receiving the commission, that's it. Because the passengers will pay, I mean, 70% of his money to the driver. And our platform will take approximately 30% of that. We'll take commission. Now, what I would do is that, instead of buying a lot of bicycles, okay, micro-mobility, I'm so sorry, but I don't mean to say this. I think this idea is not particularly good enough. Don't get me wrong, I care about the environment. I want my companies to care about the environment. But this exam is the accountancy exam. We need to care about from a financial point of view. How can you make money from that? Can you make lots of money from that? Do you need to input lots of cost and investment in doing these sort of things? Buying bicycles for the future maintenance? We're not particularly sure. But don't get me wrong. Yes, we can get rid of that segment on the exam day completely, given the solid reasons that I've uh, shared with you just now. Alternatively, we can keep that segment but not necessarily to be the most profit-making segment to my business. However, what I would do is that I want this segment to get me more traffic in order to help me to get more active customers. So later on, when I introduce subsequent services, we can get the potential revenue. So do bear that in mind, the benefits benefits of scale in the TNC industry will certainly have the network effect. So this means that if you can increase the number of active customers, so this means that we are act actually telling the customer that because lots of customers using our platform, so I can have more money to subsidize potential drivers. So drivers can make money by choosing our platform, so it will certainly reduce your waiting time and customers will be happy about that. So reducing waiting time will be very, very important. So think about it this way. You've been using Uber, I've been using Didi in China in particular, so do we care? Okay, I've used that service, I want customer service from DD. I want customer service from Uber. So does that customer service staff dial my number and ask how I feel for the previous chip? I don't really care. So the ways that we can increase the customer satisfaction will certainly be reducing my waiting time. At the same time, I choose your platform and it costs me less. So these two indicators were certainly helping bigger companies to grow further. Of course, enhancing user experience related to the service reliability and making sure that I choose this platform so the driver pick me up and then using the least time to get me to a final destination. At the same time, yes, 
brand strength will be very, very important. So this is why we would like to consolidate the market or other competitors. Potentially buying them in order that we can strengthen our brand. No, don't get me wrong. If you're simply saying, okay, I'm tired of working in the TNC industry. So I want something different. Why not to expand myself into the education industry? Now, if you can give me good reasons of doing that, absolutely fine. However, 9 out of 10, you can't persuade me if I'm the potential investor. So make sure that what you're doing, you know why you're doing it. Because for this industry to grow the business, firstly, at the industry life cycle growth stage, absolutely fine. At the same time, we we'll like to consolidate the competitors. So this is why it's to strengthen our brand and to get more active customers. And even we talk about the economics of density issue. Okay, so this means that if I have more of the active customers, I can improve the coverage, okay, uh, by whichever cities that you are living in, you can choose our service. Now, that's very, very important though. Of course, our company already been a public listed company. The real life companies, for example, Lyft choosing IPO to list and grab using the spec route so this means that a selected group of professional investors have set up a public listed company and looking for other companies to buy. So this means that Grab in 2021 was bought by that public listed company and therefore Grab company can list on the stock exchange. And did they using direct listing on the stock exchange in New York. Direct listing, this means that Didi has already been a large business, shares held by many investors, meeting the criteria from the New York Stock Exchange, it can list the company onto the stock exchange. Now, I would say that the equity finance part, don't forget, will be within your syllabus. And you need to think about the pros and cons of obtaining a listing status, not necessarily in your country currently, perhaps in another country. I would say that because now the institutional investors holding the majority of the shares, with only 10% held by the public uh, people, okay? So holding our complete 10% shares. So this means that there might be a possibility that a company would go list it again on another stock exchange. It's quite common that if you see the real life companies, okay, list it in multiple stock exchanges. You need to know the pros and cons of doing that. Right, now let's move on. Let's move on to the pre seed analysis and now let's kick off by the second paragraph, the industry information. I'm sure that you have already known a bit inside the industry, okay? So you know that this industry, in order to profit from it, at the growth stage of the industry of life cycle, you need to try something new. Now, we're told that it provides on-demand services, which means on-demand uh, whenever I want, and I can click on that, I can book the service. Now, it introduces the service from the website or the app on your phone, which is better. From my perspective, of course, app is better. But that does not necessarily mean that website will be a rubbish one. Because some of the for examples, the elderly people, they may be using a website 
if they are quite traditional. So make sure that in our syllabus, like e-marketing stuff, we can even use the website to tell potential client, especially let's say government, and they are choosing to work with us, becoming a potential client, they may book lots of services or other services from our company, they can check out on our website. So unlike traditional businesses, we do not maintain their own fleet of vehicles. Now this means that per the e-business model, In the SBO syllabus, we are talking specifically about the brokerage model. In other words, we are receiving commission, okay, each and every time from the trip. We don't even employ drivers directly. This is quite good because we don't really care about our HR problems. But hold on a second, if we do not care about the HR problem, do we need the HR director? Yes, we've got that director in our company already. Now, if we don't care about the drivers as our employees, they're independent contractors, it's good from a financial point of view. We don't even have to manage the payroll for them. However, things may change. We are working in this industry at the growth stage, absolutely fine, but more towards the maturity stage, as you can see. So if this is the case then, any sort of regulatory changes later on happens in this industry, like in the UK, that we have got the particular law governing the independent drivers, they seems to be qualifying as the staff within a business and we need to look after them. We need to even care about the trade union stuff. Okay, okay, let's come back to that later. APC, accounting for your future.